and welcome to Learn from the Experts. My name is Marianne Marzano, and I'm really excited today because I've been thinking about looking into acupuncture for a little problem I'm having with my back. And my friend here is Bonnie Diamond, and she's an expert. So I'm going to get some of my questions answered. So Bonnie, thank you for being here. Great to be here, Marianne. Now, what is the name of your business? My, the name of my business is Staying in Balance. Perfect. So I have so many questions about acupuncture. First, I'm a big baby. Does it hurt? It really doesn't hurt. OK. I actually brought my needle so I can show you. Oh. Um, Fun. Just how uh, painless the whole experience is. And so. A lot of times when I start working with people, I just show them that's the whole <gasps> thing. Oh, wow. Um, and if you notice, the needle is hair-like. Oh, yes. Um, and so the style that I do, one of the things that's special about it is it's a particularly gentle style of acupuncture. Um, and so I have patients who fall asleep while they're getting treatment. So not only doesn't it hurt, it's unbelievably relaxing. Yes. Well, I've been hearing a lot about it. So how does it work? So um, we use the five element, five organ system, and there's a whole set of correspondences that go with that. And so I just have a little diagram here. Okay. And um, so lungs uh, go with the metal element. And um, the time of the year is autumn, so we're in the time of the lungs right now. Um, so when you see lung imbalances, you're all, all often seeing uh, upper respiratory problems. Um, and there's also an emotion, grief, that goes with that. Oh, how interesting. Um, and the color is white. So there's this whole set of correspondences. Um, the next season element organ is uh, winter and the kidneys and water. Um, the emotion is fear, and the bones go with um, this organ and element. Then we have springtime, the wood element, the liver organ, tendons, and the emotion is um, anger. Cool. And then we have the fire element, which is, uh, goes with summertime and the heart, um, and the emotion is joy. And then we have uh, the earth element, which is um, late summer and goes with the spleen. Uh, it's really the whole digestive system um, and the muscles. So we use this system as a way of figuring out where there's imbalance in the body. Um, the way that I do this is um, I actually am pressing on various areas of the body. So all of the elements are represented in the abdomen. So when a patient comes in, I do a very full intake. I find out what their goals are, what they're coming to me for, and then I palpate the abdomen, and we see which organs might be out of balance. And oh. then I use points on uh, distal parts, so points far from the pain, to release any tension in the body. Oh. So the other piece of this that's important is that each organ has a meridian that goes with it. And uh, here's my acupuncture doll, and uh, you can see there are points all over the body. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, this is the liver meridian. This is the stomach meridian. Oh. So we use points along the meridians. Um, somebody comes in with pain, often there's a blockage in one of the meridians. And with treatment, we open up that blockage. So that's the, the that's kind of the basics. Right. Of, yeah, of I'm sure years of study and, and this, you just had to explain yes, it in three yes, minutes. Yes. Oh, that's fascinating. So this seems like an art form. Where how did it begin? What's the So it began um, about three thousand years ago in China. Um, we have some ancient texts where um, questions are asked of a healer and answers are given and it's all recorded. Um, and that's really when it started. We don't know who came up with the idea or how they figured this out because it's a very complex mm -hmm. um, system. But when you start to study it and practice it, it, it works as a whole. It becomes true for, for the individual, not mm -hmm. just, you know, as writing in books, but, you know, as treating patients and seeing them get out of pain and sleep better and um, feel more more relaxed. So it's it's really this amazing 
uh, amazing practice and amazing tradition that I really feel honored to be sure. um, a part of. Clutter is one of the biggest problems we have. You know, we live in this incredibly abundant society and, you know, we just keep collecting stuff and stuff and we drown in it and it starts owning us, you know. So, um, you know, that, and um, I'm, I'm always big on editing people's collections. <laughs> <laughs> You <laughs> say, you know, if you can't get rid of things, then we just have to, like, rotate them because it's too confusing to have too much stuff around, generally, you know. So h what, what makes a room look bigger or smaller? Color or mirrors or what would be a good thing to be thinking about if you're looking at your room and saying, oh, it needs something, what, what, but I don't, what should I start with? Where, where, where do I start? What do I look at first? Do I just take everything out first and then start from scratch? Well, if you're able to do that, that's a good way to start, you know, because then you can kind of go through all your collections and, you know, see what's really meaningful to you. What is it? Um, Marie Kondo wrote a book that's been on the bestseller list forever. It's like, um, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's like she's the, the Japanese guru of um, organizing, and she feels that you should only have things in your house that you truly love and need, you know. This also goes back to William Morris. I, I, won't, I won't give you a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but he's in a, he's a, it was a um, arts and crafts um, uh, philosopher and designer. Um, but in any case, yeah, well, going back to what you're, you said, you, you changed your floors to hardwood floors, mm -hmm. that's a great way to make your space look bigger, you know. Um, another thing is just to create open spaces. I recently, uh, just two weeks ago, I designed a child's bedroom uh, in Hampshire County and it was a small room and um, the father, he was a single father and he was very nervous about this child's bedroom and it was, you know, he wanted to maximize the space so um, I did it, you know, relatively inexpensively. I, I bought like Ikea furniture and so on and I put everything around the perimeter of the room by design so that there was a big, big, a big a space as you could have in the middle of the room. Cause so they bring out all those toys. Yeah, and, um, and when it was finished, you know, the father said to me, you know, you were absolutely right. You know, this really makes the room feel so much bigger. Because um, before they typically, you know, they kind of had a typical arrangement with the bed sticking out in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, it takes up a lot of space in a small bedroom. Yeah. So um, good storage is another thing that really is a big part of space planning because um, if you store things appropriately and you know where everything is and you put it back, you know, then that keeps, <laughs> <laughs> that's one that's of the, the key things. That's the key thing, put it back where it belongs. Yeah, yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, when I talk to people, I try and, you know, really work with what their situation is. You know, I'm, I'm not like a cookie cutter, you know, got to do it this way. And one of my longtime clients, again, in Westchester, um, she had a special place for um, kind of having conferences with her children. And that special place happened to be in her bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, you know, all right, it's a little odd, but let's go with it, you know. And so when I redid their bathroom, and it was actually it was a very large bathroom, um, I put in a, you know, a comfy chair, and she would sit by her makeup mirror mm -hmm. and so on, because she spent a lot of time in front of the makeup mirror. And she had discussions with her children, you know, about, you know, what's going on in their lives and so on. And, you know, it was kind of like their special little place. So, you know, um, you, you know, whatever comes your way, you, if it's working, you want to keep it going as well, you know? Yep. Yeah. And what about color? Mm -hmm. And um, is color more about decorating the room or is it more about you, the person, to decide what colors mm -hmm. you want? I think it's probably a little bit of both. You know, people, um, some people go to their closet to try and figure out what kind of colors they want to use. It doesn't always work in interiors um, because, you know, like me, you know, I love purples and pinks and stuff, but I don't know if I really want to live in a purple and pink house. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think um, people get really hung up on colors, and it's the thing that people respond most to. Like when I, can, when I make a presentation, you know, sometimes I'll do a, a presentation, um, you know, the same furniture in two different color schemes, and people will be drawn to one or the other usually very strongly. So if you had mm. one tip they could give our audience today as to if they're thinking about their space mm -hmm. planning, uh, what would that be? Um, well, I would say, um, 
hire a designer. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I am the owner of a home care agency. Um, we service seniors and, and um, people in the community that might have disabilities or might be chronically ill. We go into their homes and provide care services for them. That's great. And that, that service needs to be growing as our population ages and more people don't want to go mm -hmm. to nursing homes. So you're definitely providing a good service. Right. So what do you see as the biggest need out there? Like from what angle are you? Um, the biggest need is, um, in my opinion, is educating the caregivers that go into the homes to provide the care for the seniors or whomever they're caregiving for. Um, families in general, because a lot of agencies have caregivers that are trained to go in um, so they know what to expect, they know how to handle the potential client. A lot of family caregivers are thrown into the situation mm -hmm. uh, unexpectedly a lot of times. Um, and even if it is expected, they still don't have um, some of the tools and information um, and training to take care of the family member um, as best as they could. Now, um, what is your particular training process for a new uh, employee as they come into your company? Okay. Um, our training process involves um, an orientation to the company, of course, but it also involves training um, in areas of dementia care, mm -hmm. um, Alzheimer's care, um, how to prevent caregiver burnout. Um, so things like that. What else do we do? Uh, we talk about tips to um, go into the home and, and make it an easier and more rewarding experience. Right. So um, you have to come into this kind of area of uh, caregiving with compassion. You have to oh, come sure, with compassion. Point, yeah. You have to come with a big heart. Um, it's a big sacrifice. So, And where do you get uh, the, your employees um, nursing aid students or uh, what, are the, what is the um, term that they use? A certified a nurse certified nurses aide yes or certified home health aide yes um, or and what's the difference between the two? Um, a certified nursing aide has um, a bit more training than a certified home health aide. A, c a certified nursing aide, a CNA, can go in and work in hospitals. Um, they're generally placed in hospitals or convalescent homes, um, assisted living places. Um, certified home health aides work in the homes um, anywhere that the client lives. Now also with your employees that and your um, customers that hire you to provide the service, is any of those services uh, covered by any form of insurance? There are services that are covered by Medicare, or Medicaid, long-term insurance, um, or individual pay. Mm -hmm. And do you go into um, like a planned community, like an assisted living, do you offer services in, in that type of a setting as well? Yes, we do. We offer services in assisted living, um, convalescent home, anywhere the client or patient calls home. So okay. we go anywhere they live. Yes. Right. So do you also help family members? You, you mentioned family members. So do you do any kind of training with family members? Is that part of your service? Yes, it is. When we go in and we assess um, a potential client, we go in with, we sit down with the family, we go over a care plan. Um, if they, it depends on what the services they're looking for, it depends on what they need. If they need, um, you know, more than three or four hours a day, we sit down with them and we go over what could be done, what, you know, the best outcome for the patient. And we teach them um, when we're not in, um, to provide the services, we teach them how to take care of the patient, you know, to our standards, which right. is excellence, of course. Of, of course. course. Of course. Yes. <laughs> now, you mentioned burnout. Yes. So do you address burnout with your clients? I'm with, uh, yes, your clients, families. Do you address that with them? Yes, we do. It's very important that they know that um, the job that they take on, whether we come in and help, um, or they are planning on taking care of most of the services for their family alone, we let them know that it is a big job. It's not a small job. Um, it's, you know, it seems that way at first. It seems as if, oh, well, I can do this, but you really can't do it alone. You really can't do it all by yourself. So we let them know it's important to ask for help for that respite care. It's really, really, really important um, to have some sort of um, plan in place so when you do start to get frustrated or burned out or right. tired, someone else can come in and, and help out. 